internet. What's that? I've started recording. Yes. Okay. Well, with that, uh, I, I want to thank Dr. Blong for joining us from Poland and talk, talking about what he's done and what he uh, has been involved with uh, in his research. Thanks, Dr. John. Thanks, Dr. Blong. No problem, Dale. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for the uh, for the introduction. I'm going to share my screen here so I can get my slides up. Okay. There it is. And I'm going to uh, there we go. Share that. Wow. And I'm hoping you can see a nice picture of the Alaska Range right there. And I'm just going to uh, put my slides into slide mode here, and, and hopefully you can see my slides now. That does that look good? Yeah. Yes. You can see my my first slide there. Okay. Beautiful. All right. Um, so yeah, uh, Dale, you're right. Uh, after we talked yesterday, I, I did decide to add some some slides in on my Paisley Caves research too. And so um, I'm going to kind of give you, a, I guess, a, a broad overview of a lot of kind of things I'm interested in and, and research I'm doing. A, a good chunk of it is related to the the peopling of the Americas, and a lot of it's been focused up in Alaska. But obviously, the the Paisley Caves plays an important role too in that in that peopling uh, conversation. And so. Um, you know, um, I'll say that I probably should have had a, a more extended title of my talk that also included something about the Great Basin, but um, I'm going to talk about the hun hunter gatherers in the Central Alaska Range, but I'm also going to talk about the, my research in the Great Basin and Paisley Caves too, so that'll be tacked on at the end. Um, and so just to kind of get this out here, when I, when I talk about the late glacial period, I'm talking about the end of the Pleistocene and into the early part of the Holocene, so roughly about 17,000 to 11,000 years ago. And this is the period after the last glacial maximum um, and through the Younger Dryas and into the early Holocene. And this kind of this rapid period of environmental uh, change and um, uh, a, a period where we see the first evidence, the first you know, really solid evidence for people coming into the Americas, right? So um, this is an important time period for, for those of us who are interested in these research questions. So here's just a little outline just to kind of give us focused on, on where we're going. So I'm going to focus a lot of my attention on this work in the central part of uh, south central part of Alaska. You can see that, that outline there in, in the in the map in the bottom. Um, part of my research has been uh, kind of reviewing previous work and looking at museum collections. And I'm going to use that to build this case for what we know about the late glacial archaeology of the central Alaska range. And then I'll talk to you about some on the ground archaeology I've been doing, this field work in the upper Susitna Basin. Um, and then, as I said, I'll, I'll kind of shift gears a little bit and talk about the work I've been doing at the Paisley Caves, looking at the evidence for early occupation there, kind of the timing of when people got there. And then also we've been doing some really interesting work looking at um, using these copper lights to, to look at diet during the Western stem tradition. So that again is that kind of late glacial period that's spanning the end of the Pleistocene and into the early Holocene. Um, and so um, I'll, you know, do my best to make some connections between this and, uh, and uh, come to a, a, some conclusions at the end that kind of tie together my various strands of research. I'll just say too, I'm not only interested in the, the, the late glacial period up in Alaska, I'll, I'll talk to you about some of the middle and late Holocene archaeology I've been doing up there too. So, um, you know, just a, a pretty broad range uh, temporally and geographically that we'll be covering here tonight. So to try to focus this a little bit, I'll just give you a bit some background about who I am. Um, you know, as Dale said, I'm, I'm, I'm an environmental archeologist. I'm really interested in how humans and the environment kind of interacted throughout prehistory. Um, I'm primarily interested in hunter gatherers in, in, in prehistory. Um, you know, one of the things um, uh, uh, I'll say, I got my start early on uh, on the East Coast. I grew up in New Jersey. And so I, I kind of cut my teeth on Eastern archeology. span I did do a master's degree actually on, lithic, on a Clovis lithic assemblage from the Higgins site, which is over there in Maryland. Um, when I was in my PhD program, my advisor invited me to come up to Alaska to do some field work up there. And I basically kind of fell in love with the area up there and, and all the research potential and kind of never ended up going back to the East Coast, archeologically speaking, I guess. Um, but I've also done work in the, in the Paisley Caves, uh, as Dale's mentioned, and I also have some, some collaborations I do out in Siberia uh, with some colleagues um, in, uh, working at the Kavrichka site. 
and that it ties into the to the work in Alaska because you know the folks that came into Alaska, uh, the best we know, kind of came from that area in Siberia, whether it be interior or the coast or, or somewhere around there. We're still trying to figure some of that out. Um, so that just kind of gives you a little bit of, of, of context for, for where I'm coming from. Um, I am a geoarchaeologist. I'm also a, a paleoethnic botanist, um, but I also am a lithic analyst too. So I kind of use a bunch of different tools for, for answering my, my questions about what people did in the past. Um, the big picture context to try to organize the stuff I'm going to talk about today. Um, I am interested in the peopling of the Americas. And this is of interest to me because this is really the, the last chapter in this story of, of human settlement of the globe, right? Um, Homo sapiens spread throughout the globe and one of the last places they, they settled into were, was the Americas. Um, and we know that people came here sometime at the end of the last ice age. And uh, you know, pretty quickly after that, they had explored and settled the entire continent. Um, but we're still learning a lot about this process of how this happened, right? Um, in particular, the you know the more precise timing, um, the the routes people took, and importantly for me, how people adapted to the the really diverse ecological landscapes that they encountered when when they got here, and you know you all are in tune with this as Dale just said you've, you've been working on this uh, Sahelis River hypothesis right, and that's one of these ways of exploring or querying you know how did people get here. Um, and there, we're, we're still working with several kind of models or ideas of, of how people might have gotten here. This map right here is a, is a map from a paper Mike Waters published in 2018 that kind of just looks at some of these routes, uh, potential routes and some of these early sites. And, you know, for me, this is just a really exciting area of research is, is mostly because of the unknown still, right? We've got these interesting, new interesting data points that are coming every year, but still a lot of unknown. So that's kind of the context for some of the big picture, right? Um, and then also, this is a period of rapid climate change, as I said. And so, you know, moving past just when people first got here, how did they, you know, manage their 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 lives in this new landscape with this rapidly changing climate, right? As we moved from the Pleistocene to the to the Holocene, and we had kind of dramatic restructuring of the of the ecology of the landscapes of, of North and South America. Um, and so, these are some of the, the questions that really drive my research program. Um, I'm also interested in how people use uh, marginal environments, right? So these are environments that are characterized by climate extremes, low productivity, and they generally represent challenging landscapes for, for humans to make a living on. Um, but at the same time, a lot of these landscapes have these kind of unique resources or novel resources that, that aren't available anywhere else that draw people in, right? They're attractive to humans, whether it be certain rock types up in the mountains or certain types of plants out in the, the arid part of the Great Basin. So I'm really interested to, to tie these areas together. I'm interested in use of the marginal environments in the Alaska range, um, but also arid environments because the desert environments, the high desert of, of the Great Basin. Right? And these are you know, characterized in, uh, ecologically as marginal landscapes. Um, and this ties into this understanding, again, of what people did once they got here. Once people got here, there's this trend towards increasing land use intensification over time, um, represented by increased use of marginal landscapes like uplands and desert areas. Um, we see people broadening their diet, eating a variety of different types of foods, introducing new food processing techniques like grinding stones and things like that to try to take advantage of some of these new feed res resources. And this really mirrors trends that we see around the world of this, this uh, timing of the intensification of land use over uh, uh, throughout the world. Um, but there's a lot of debate about when this happened, right? Is this something that happened in the Pleistocene? Um, some folks say it was a later thing in the middle and late Holocene. Um, and for me, I'm, I'm interested in what human use of these marginal environments can tell us about the, the process of settlement of the Americas, but also what happened afterwards. You know, um, when did people start intensifying land use? What drove them to use some of these marginal environments consistently over time? Um, and so that's kind of the context, the, the big picture context for, for my research. Um, I'll start just by talking about my, my interest up in Alaska and the central part of the Alaska Range. Um, this is part of the Alaska Range Uplands Project. And this is an investigation of, of how people adapted to uh, high altitude ecosystems. And I get to these answers by looking at lithic artifacts, by looking at um, geoarchaeological, uh, geoarchaeological study of sediments to reconstruct landscapes. Um, I look for paleoecological signals for reconstructing past environments, things like pollen and plant macrofossils. 
I'm not going to touch on all those things today, but I'll, I'll, I'll give you an overview of some of the work I've been doing in this region. So this area was pretty heavily glaciated during the last glacial maximum. So we're talking about 20,000 years ago when a lot of that area was locked up with ice. And as, as, you, as Dale mentioned, you know, you're, you're familiar with that, with the, the coastal ice and just, you know, barely some refugia along the coast, um, most of the coast there. And so similarly, this area was all kind of locked up with ice. Um, but by about 14,000 years ago, we see this ice starting to recede pretty significantly. Uh, it's, it starts before then, but by 14,000 years ago, it's pretty well receded. Um, and this was right about the time that we first see the first evidence for, for humans in this part of Alaska um, at the Swan Point site where we have archaeology dating back 14,200 years ago. That's up there in the Tanana Basin, which is this cluster of sites in yellow up here that are some of the earliest sites in, in Alaska. And we have this trend of sort of stepwise settlement from this interior into these uplands and down into south central Alaska um, and then pushing down towards the Cook Inlet area, as, as was mentioned before. And we see this happening over time, and you can kind of track this in the dates of, of sites that, that are, uh, are shown here. Um, but overall, we have kind of a sparse place to see record, right? So there's still a lot to learn about what's going on in this part of the world um, uh, throughout this period of interest. So the, the prevailing model of land use in interior Alaska was developed by uh, Ben Potter from the University of Alaska Fairbanks. And he developed this, this, this conception of how people use the, the, the uplands by looking at um, the elevation of sites and the radiocarbon dates associated with those sites over time. And so he built this model here where, where he, uh, uh, in looking at these, these, uh, these lines of data, he um, shows here that there are not very many sites in the uplands in the late Pleistocene, more in the early Holocene, but it's not until the middle Holocene that people start really intensively using these upland areas, right? Um, and uh, during the late Pleistocene and early Holocene, um, he thinks that people were primarily settling down in the, in the lowlands, right? They, they came into Alaska, they have great resources down in these lowlands, there's abundant uh, uh, faunal and, and uh, uh, floral resources on the landscape. And so they're just hanging out down in the lowlands for the most part. And it's not until the middle Holocene, whether that be linked to environmental change or population pressure, we don't know, but it's not until the middle Holocene that people started moving logistically into these upland areas. So by logistical, I mean they're, they've got their camps down in the lowlands and they're sending small groups of people up for specific resources up into the upland areas. So this is this prevailing model. But, you know, in, in my review of some of the data that we have out there, um, I've noticed that there are these clues in the archaeological record that we may be missing the extent of the early human use of these upland landscapes and just broader land use in general, right? One of these lines of evidence is um, obsidian stone artifacts. And so these obsidian stone artifacts are found at many early sites in Alaska, as you can see in this map here, are these orange sites, these terminal Pleistocene sites. Um, now, you, you probably have heard of this, obsidian has unique geochemistry, and we can typically analyze this geochemistry and trace it back to the a particular source location. There are two main sources in Alaska. We've got the Wiki Peak uh, down here in the Alaska Range, um, the kind of the eastern part of the Alaska Range, and then Batsatana up here um, in the, uh, the, the, the hilly area up here um, uh, north of my study area, north and west of my study area. And so this lithograph material sourcing data from these early sites indicates that people were stomping all over this landscape, basically, right? They were traversing across upland landscapes, lowland landscapes. They were specifically, it appears, up in these upland areas, harvesting or collecting obsidian, presumably up there hunting and collecting obsidian while they're there, and transporting this hundreds of kilometers across Alaska back to these sites, these early sites, right? And so this suggests to me that there is this pretty extended land use early on in the settlement of Alaska, with people just moving around a lot more than, than they're currently getting credit for with the, the current models, saying that they basically just hung out in this lowlands here of the, the Tanana River Basin. So why do we see this seemingly contradictory record? Um, well, probably part of it is sample bias. So this is, uh, these, these are these uh, well-known late glacial sites here in the central Alaska range. Um, white, these, uh, these things in white here are just road systems. And you'll notice that all these sites that we have discovered are all along road systems here. The, the exceptions, exceptions being um, these sites down here in the, uh, in the uh, middle part of the Susitna, which were discovered as part of the Watana Hydroelectric Dam Project. So basically these sites have only been discovered if there's a road built through there, if there's a dam being built, right? 
So um, a lot of this construction has been in low elevation areas. Um, a lot of surveys have been driven by construction in low, area, low elevation areas. So that's where most of our evidence comes from. Um, there's been long-term academic research in the Tanana Basin here, and then the Nanana River Basin here. So all these things have really kind of um, overbalanced the, the lowland record, in, in my opinion, right? We also probably have some taphonomic bias going on here in that in these lowland areas, there's these beautiful deep sediment profiles and the, the early period archeology span is well buried and protected from the elements. And so you can get um, nice features and you can radiocarbon date materials. And you get up in the uplands as you know, anybody who's ever gone for a hike up in the mountains knows, you, you tend to get rockier and shallow, shallower soils. So sites up here tend to be either sitting on the surface and things like charcoal and bone are kind of weathered away or just you know degrade over time, um, or maybe they're shallowly buried. So it's hard to get dates for sites up here. A lot of times what we just find is scatter of stone tools just kind of hanging out on the landscape. Um, and so I think that this is part of a, a, the issue too, is just this taphonomic bias. And um, so this kind of sets the context for, for my, inter my, my interest up here, right? Is, is for in, my, in my mind, we, we've got this interesting evidence that, that there's, there's more going on than we give folks credit for. And it's just, you know, the, the, the record we have from the lowlands is mostly because of just, you know, survey bias. So my research questions are, um, you know, when did people really occupy the, the, the Alaska range? And this is essentially a geoarchaeological study, right? Going and looking for sites to date, um, finding places where there are deeper sediments in these upland areas. Um, I'm also interested in the environmental context of human occupation. And so for me, it's important to understand the environment to kind of give some context to human behavior, right? We need to know the environmental background um, so we can better understand changes in human behavior. And that's where the paleoecological research comes in. Um, and then I'm also interested, you know, moving past just the early settlement, what, is the what was the nature of occupation over time? How did, how did people uh, use this landscape over time? Um, and so, as I said before, this is, uh, I use lithic uh, analysis for this, looking at patterns and lithic assemblages to try to recreate how people use the landscape over time. So I'll start, um, as I said, there's kind of two parts to my Alaska Range research. Part of it is just reviewing existing data. And I'll start uh, by looking at some of this. And this is research that I published in a paper in Paleoamerica. Um, and this is all previously published radiocarbon dates. And I just kind of compiled this. And um, you can see on the bottom here is this, this the dates going back. Uh, we've got dates going back to about 13,500 years ago. And pretty consistent radiocarbon dates across this late glacial period that I'm interested in. Um, so this distribution of dates, these are all sites up in the, up, in the uplands, late glacial sites in the uplands on the right here. And so when we look at these radiocarbon dates, we see evidence that this was a pretty continuously occupied period throughout the late glacial, um, a, a pretty continuously occupied landscape throughout the late glacial period. And, you know, it was occupied not too soon after uh, uh, um, or not, not too far from when people first started showing up in this part of the world, right? Um, Swamp Point's 14,200 years ago. We've got dates about 13,500 years ago in the, in the foothills region of the, of the Alaska Range. And so this suggests to me that there really weren't very many ecological constraints on the uh, initial occupation of this area. No, there was no post-glacial hangover stopping people from coming up there. Um, it looks like people were getting up into the uplands pretty soon uh, when, after they appeared on the landscape in Alaska. I'm just going to go through a couple of these sites here that are important. I've been working with some of the collections. These were excavated by other folks, but I've been working with the museum collections to, to try to get a better handle on what's going on with the lithic technology. The Road Array site is an important one. This is um, not too far from Denali National Park, if you've been, ever been up that way. Um, it's kind of nestled in this valley within the mountain region here. Um, at 640 meters above sea level. Um, it's got a pretty extensive lithic assemblage. There's uh, a lot of bifaces being made here, bifacial stone tools. Um, there's some bone fragments, just some generic bones that probably came from some sort of mammal, but also bird. So it seems like people were hunting bird here. Um, a couple of hearth features with dates around this younger dryest period here. Uh, folks at the site were uh, mostly producing and maintaining bifacial tools, and we've got various stages of biface production going on here. When they were at this campsite, they were picking up raw material locally, so they didn't appear to be coming in with a bunch of tools and, and uh, rock needed for their hunting activities. They, they kind of seemed like they, they knew that there was good rock there, and they, they knew they were going to a place where they could make tools while they were there. 
And this has been interpreted to be a short-term seasonal hunting camp up in the mountains. Another site, Carlo Creek, again, excavated by, uh, this is excavated by Pete Bowers. Um, this is not too far from a road away in that Upland Valley area. Um, two components, but we're mostly interested in this early one that dates to the uh, uh, earliest part of the Holocene. Um, we do have caribou bone here, also doll sheep, um, and also uh, squirrel, brown squirrel. Uh, bones from this from this site. So it appears that all those uh, animals were on the menu when people were here. Um, again, we have hearth features with some uh, some charcoal that dates to about this the end of the uh, uh, early part of the Holocene. There, again, really uh, invested in producing bifaces here. Um, it appears the, these bag pieces have wear that appears that they were using as chopping and scraping tools, but they were discarded. They're these pretty heavy, uh, robust bag faces, and they appear to have been used and just discarded. And again, this kind of indicates that folks, um, well, they're using local raw material. Again, this, this rock is very common throughout the assemblage and it's available just right behind the site. So it appears people were pretty comfortable knowing when they came up here, they had good rock available and knew where they were going, probably had more rock because they, they just made these tools and just abandoned them, it appears. Um, and this is interpreted to be a short-term logistical resources extraction camp um, based on the, the animals that were found there. Uh, it was probably occupied in the late summer or, or fall period. So this indicates that there's some seasonality to occupation here. Um, the, the Tangle Lakes area, which is a little bit further on the south side of the, the Alaska Range, uh, not too far from the Susitna Basin where I've done a lot of my field work. There's a couple key sites here. Oops, sorry about that. There's a couple key sites here Two of these are the Phipps site and Whitmore Ridge. And so these, these are sites that are located on these um, high areas around the, the Tangle Lakes here. Um, at the Phipps site, we see some, uh, a move away from bifacial technology. People are producing microblades. And these are these tiny little ra stone razor blades that we think were probably inset into bone uh, projectile points. So they're kind of like these little razor blade edges on these, on these bone points. Um, we've got charcoal dates that place this around the uh, end of the Younger Dryas and into the early Holocene. And then there's a site nearby called the Whitmore Ridge site um, that has two components. Again, we're interested in the earliest one for this talk here. Um, some microblade technology, also some biface manufacture going on here. So kind of a mixed bag of assemblages here. And the microblades are, are interesting because when we see microblade technology, um, well, let me preface this by saying there's a lot of debate about what microblade technology means, but one interpretation of it is that people are making these microblades in advance, uh, these microblade cores, as kind of preparing to go do a certain activity, maybe not, not being so confident in the raw material resources that are there. Uh, they're they're uh, um, you know, bringing high quality raw material with themselves um, to, to, to these locations. And sure enough, we see when we look at these assemblages that the, for example, at Phipps, the, the most of the flake debitage from you know tool production is on local material, this local argillite rock. But the microblade material is on this non-local turf, this really high quality kind of glassy looking stuff that was brought in from elsewhere. Um, we also have some obsidian and we've sourced that to a source in the Talkeetna Mountains, which is 100 kilometers southwest. So that's even getting further south. So, you know, if we're talking about how far people were moving down towards the coast um, uh, at this time during the Younger Dryas, and we've got evidence that, that they were down in the Talkeetna Mountains, which is, you know, getting pretty close to Cook Inlet. Um, uh, and moving obsidian from there back up again. So again, just more evidence that people are moving around these landscapes more than we give them credit for. Um, so, you know, there's some specialized activities going here. We've got these burins down here in the lower left that are typically used for engraving, um, for either engraving wood or, or bone. Um, and those are probably tied into the use of these microblades. So creating these inset stone razor blade tools. Um, and this is interpreted to be a short-term activity camp, probably occupied during the winter time. And contrast a little bit with Whitmore Ridge, where we've got, again, we have local production of, of bifaces on these, using these local materials. Um, and again, we have uh, non-local chert. Um, but the biface production is much more dominant here. So the folks at Whitmore Ridge were focusing a lot more on collecting local raw material and, and, and making bifaces, probably for, for hunting up in, the, in these upland areas. Um, we think that these bifaces were being used as part of an atlatl system, maybe for hunting uh, doll sheep or caribou up, up in this area. 
And then finally, the, the, the last example I'll, I'll, I'll pull up here is the, the J Creek Bridge site. Again, we see local raw material procurement. So this is kind of a theme, right? Where people seem to be pretty comfortable with the local raw material resources. They know what they're getting into up here, except for in a couple examples where microblades are, are, are showing up on exotic chart, we see that, that people are, are taking advantage of local rock sources when they're in the uplands. Um, so uh, here we have these kind of unique little points um, that are made on small stone flakes and they're just kind of trimmed along the edges to make these, these tiny projectile points here. We don't know what these are for yet. Some people have suggested they're specialized for hunting sheep. Um, you know, we need to do some use wear or something like that to, to figure out exactly what they were used for. Um, but this is a little bit of a bigger site. And so it's interpreted to represent a more extensive occupation, either a longer term occupation or a larger group. And so again, this is just some of the sites that I've been going through the collections and reviewing um, the, the lithic assemblages from. And uh, this is a figure from that publication where I kind of try to get tie together what we know so far uh, about um, what people were doing in the uplands during this late glacial period. And so I'll focus on three things. I'll focus on subsistence data, um, sort of the, 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 the raw material patterns, and then, um, you know, uh, what we know about site types here, right? So as far as subsistence goes, it's a little bit slim with the record. There's limited subsistence data. Again, that's, you know, it's probably because a lot of these sites are um, uh, pretty shallowly buried. We don't always have great preservation, but it looks like people were up here hunting elk, uh, wapiti or elk, um, doll sheep, bison, you know, even eating bird, caribou and ground squirrel. <clears throat> and so while we're probably missing some importance of citizen data because the overall uh, paucity of the record, um, we do have a, a, a snapshot at least of what people were doing. And it suggests that there's some continuity over, over time, right? People were hunting bison all throughout this, this time period represented here. They're hunting doll sheep all throughout this time period. Um, but we do see some indications of increasing diet breath uh, at the end of the Younger Dryas and early Holocene. So things like, um, you know, sh uh, uh, caribou, bird, and squirrel are, are starting to show up in the record, right? So, you know, that may be linked to environmental change associated with the, the, the Younger Dryas and early Holocene. Um, disturbing the, you know, the, the, the patterning of resources and, and resulting in people starting to, to broaden the, the types of food they're targeting. But again, you know, I don't want to overinterpret with just the limited record that we have. Um, but these, re these, these resources do have some seasonal patterns. For example, caribou are typically only up in the, in the uplands in the, in the summertime, where they go up there in high elevations to get away from uh, the biting flies that, that, uh, that bug them in the, in the lowlands um, in the summertime. So, um, some of the patterning that we see, um, you know, for example, ground squirrels hibernate during the winter, right? So we're starting to see some emerging evidence that there's some seasonality to the occupation here. Um, and so these forays up into the uplands might have been driven by the, the need or the, the desire to, to, to get these seasonally available subsistence resources that might not have been available in the lowlands. When looking at the raw material patterns, again, there's this, this overarching pattern where people are mostly coming with little material on hand. Um, but when they did get material, when they did bring material that was from far away, it sometimes came from hundreds of kilometers away. Uh, people made a variety of different types of tools here, probably speaking to the variety of different types of activities that were going on in the uplands. Um, uh, but again, just the, the point being that, that there um, seems to be some previous landscape knowledge for, for the folks that were coming up here. You know, they, they weren't uh, first time forayers up here for most of these occupations that we have. Um, and most of these are interpreted to represent short-term occupations. There's not a lot of structure, there aren't any structures, there's not a lot of extensive you know, hearth features or any kind of indications that people were up here for a really long period of time. And so overall, um, it seems like people were up here, coming up here on a seasonal basis, probably small groups um, occupying short-term camps that were probably reoccupied over time. And again, just with a pretty good knowledge of, of resources in this landscape. Um, and so this just, this just indicates that people were, were using this landscape in the, in the late glacial period more than we give them credit for to kind of come back around to, you know, to comparing this to our existing models that we have. And so I'm going to transition to talking about my work in the Susitna Basin. And so this is where I'm actually on the ground kind of trying to test this a little bit more. So I've picked this area of Alaska um, in, the, in the, the central Alaska range that's highlighted down here in the, in the, the red box here. 
the upper part of the Susitna River that does drain into the Cook Inlet. So it's kind of a, uh, the uppermost parts of that river, but it does wind its way all the way down into the, uh, to the Cook Inlet area. And so this is where I'm on the ground kind of testing these ideas, trying to excavate sites and, and, and find evidence for, for um, early occupation here. And I'll, I'll give you a little spoiler alert. We haven't found any really old sites here yet. There are at least ones like Lake Dale said are about 11,000 years old in this part of, the, of Alaska. Um, but this is an ongoing uh, uh, research project up here. And so just applying this, this, this same, these same questions, you know, interested in when people got to this area, um, what was the context of this occupation and, and how did occupation change over time? And this is an interesting area to me because we've got all of these different kind of upland landscapes in, encapsulated in one area. We've got these broad upland valleys like you see here on the left. That's the Susitna River right there. It's pretty heavily braided because it comes uh, out of the Susitna glaciers not too far from there. Um, we've got these rolling hills with these shrub, uh, shrub birch landscapes. And then we get up in the upland areas and the proper you know, mountain peaks and we've got these high alpine areas. You can see the caribou um, coming up in the snow patches there. Um, so, you know, this potentially represents the, the full range of upland landscapes that people would have exploited in the past. This is also interesting because this area was completely glaciated 14,000 years ago. And so it kind of sets this, this there's like a, a reset then, right? So it, at 14,000 years ago, um, the glaciers recede and um, this, this area opens up for, for human habitation. And so I'm interested in when did this area become habitable and what can that tell us about how long it takes landscapes to, to recover from glaciation? Because obviously that's something we're interested in with glaciated landscapes uh, all throughout the, the, the Northwest coast. And understanding how people utilize them as glacial ice receded in the Pleistocene. So a big part of this is going out and just doing geoarchaeological resource research, looking for landscapes where we find deeply buried sites. Um, so just doing some initial survey and testing. Here we found a, a blowout on this sand dune, and this dune does have pretty deep deposits. And so this is the kind of area that we're really interested in, right? This has potential for, for buried archaeology here. And I'll return to this, this dune area in, in a couple slides here. Um, so this is a map of the study area that, that I've, I've kind of focused on. Um, from our work up there, we found 20 previously unrecorded sites. And so we found a lot of archaeology up there. Um, 12 of these we thought were worthwhile excavating. So we excavated 12 of them. And 12 of these had buried deposits. And so this is part of the, the fruits of this geoarchaeological study was identifying areas where we had buried sites that we could date. And we found evidence for early through late Holocene occupation. So, you know, a couple sites right at that Pleistocene-Holocene boundary and then occupation throughout the, the, the Holocene period. So I'm just going to give you some, some of the highlights. So there's these three sites here that, that are uh, some of the more important ones that we've excavated up there. The Susitna Dune area, Susitna River 3, and then Butte Creek 1. This is that Susitna Dune region that I, I showed you of uh, serving the blowout. Um, this is important because, you know, there's some archaeology here, but even dunes are even great just for reconstructing past environments, right? Because they're, they're, they're a record of wind speed and sediments over time. Um, the, they oftentimes capture evidence for soils forming. They capture, they, they preserve um, things like charcoal that you can use to radiocarbon date uh, events throughout prehistory. Um, and so these are really key for understanding uh, post-glacial post landscape recovery, which is one of my interests, as I said. And so these provide evidence for, uh, you know, the high wind landscape about 14,000 years ago. This is as those glaciers are, you know, have their last gasp in this area and are receding. Um, charcoal from this dune suggests post-glacial landscape recovery at least by 12,200 years ago. And we did find a cervid uh, mandible um, associated with some lithic artifacts that dates to about 11,000 years ago. And this is that earliest, earliest site we have there. So this suggests that, you know, um, so this is either caribou or elk. It was too degraded to, to be sure which one it was. So, you know, by about 11,000 years ago, uh, definitely uh, there's caribou or elk up here, there's humans hunting up here, um, but probably uh, before then there was um, uh, a habitable landscape up there. Um, so this really gives us good information on the timing of post-glacial landscape recovery and the earliest evidence for, for people up in this area. Now, most of our sites look more, more similar to this. They're more shallowly buried when you get off that dune. Um, this is the stratigraphy from Susitna River 3, and this is pretty typical for the study area. Um, it has this archaeological record spanning the Holocene. Um, so sediments are shallow, only about 35, 40 centimeters deep. 
Most of the sediment here is actually deposited, uh, a tephra that's been deposited. So you see kind of this bluish horizon here, and then this kind of rusty to tan horizon, then this white horizon. Most of the sediment that's been deposited up here is just these, you know, these specific events of, of tephra that's being deposited from volcanoes down in the Cooklin Inlet region. And these have these regional names, the Oshetna, Watana, and Devil Tephra. And I've done some geochemical work that I'm not going to talk about here um, to characterize these. And I know that these have chemical signatures that match up pretty well with these established tephras. Um, and so this is important because these kind of give these time slices, right? We know when these tephras were deposited. So we can use these to kind of chronologically uh, uh, sort out all the archaeology that we're finding as we're digging. Um, and so we find that most of these sites, we see these stable surfaces represented by soil development. Um, it's kind of hard to see here, but there's a soil that formed here. There's another one that formed on top of this Oshetna tephra. Uh, there's another soil that's formed here. And so the story at a lot of these sites is that we've got landscape stability and people are living here. Um, then we have these you know, punctuated periods of tephra fall. Then the, the landscape stabilizes again and people are living on that landscape and then tephra fall and then you know, stabilized landscape again and people are, are, are living there. Um, at this site and many others, we find occupations kind of sequence into these three cultural components representing this early Holocene, middle Holocene and, and late Holocene occupations here. Um, so this is again part of this geoarchaeological study is just figuring out how these landscape forms and, and, and what kind of information we can get about the chronology of people living here based on excavating these sites. I'm also, as I said, uh, looking at, or I've looked at lithic uh, uh, artifacts from these sites to try to get a, a better picture of how people were using the landscape, not just when they were there, but how, right? Um, and so I approach this from a technological organization um, uh, study approach. So this is a way of, of using stone tools to assess how people are using the landscape. Um, so I've looked at lithic assemblages from six sites, from nine cultural components at six sites. Um, just uh, going through different attributes of the lithic assemblages to, to try to characterize um, uh, differences and similarities over time and use this technological organization approach to understand in, uh, human adaptive strategies over time. And I'll just give you the, the overview of this, this uh, the results of this analysis here. Um, we see changes in lithic raw material use over time, uh, indicate that, indicating that there is probably more permanent occupation of the uplands in the middle and late Holocene. The earliest sites, the early Holocene, or the, the one primary early Holocene site and some of these other smaller components we have, have evidence for this, uh, for use of this fine grain non-local chirp, right? So we see that people were probably coming up into this area um, without, uh, uh, or with the raw materials they needed for their early uh, hunting activities, right? And that suggests possibly um, some, you know, initial, initial forays into this area where there's a little bit of landscape learning going on, right? So carrying the materials you need with you. And by the middle Holocene, people are pretty well in tune with the, lo the, the local resources. They're settling up there for what appears to be longer periods of time based on site density and the you know, intensity of use as we interpret from you know, more hearth features and the size of these features. And same thing for the late Holocene too. Um, and so this suggests that there's a more permanent occupation in the middle Holocene and the late Holocene. Um, again, the middle Holocene, we have these, uh, early Holocene, we have these ephemeral sites. We don't really have any significant cultural features suggesting kind of short-term occupations. By the middle Holocene, we get these hearth features, um, with these extensive, this is from Butte Creek 1. There's this extensive bone burning feature. There's what appears to be an anvil stone, tons of caribou bone, even some beaver bone here. It looks like people were set up here and pretty intensively harvesting resources, um, uh, probably during the summertime in the middle Holocene. We also see the artifact density increasing significantly during the Holocene. And this really fits with that model that I showed you before of that Ben Potter developed, where his analysis suggested that the middle Holocene was a period of increased upland use. And so our research does suggest that that, that is true here in the upper Susitna as well. Uh, in the middle Holocene, there's something changing where there's increased use of these upland areas over time, uh, in that time period. So just a little bit about the specifics from these time period. I'm just going to focus on the lithics from, from um, Susitna River 3 because it kind of gives a nice indication of, of the change in technology over time. Again, we have this non-lithic, uh, non-local lithic raw material. We've got a really small toolkit. Um, 
made of these tiny retouched flakes, these burins, which remember are those kind of great engraving tools probably for making uh, those inset razor blade stone or bone, uh, stone, I'm uh, sorry, um, bone or, or, uh, or wood points. Um, and then uh, uh, various types of small retouch burin spalls, again, look for, probably used for specific kind of working activities. So we have this specialized economized toolkit, right? There's producing small flakes off of material that they're bringing in. Um, folk, a real focus on maintaining the tools that were brought onto this site. Um, and this has the indications, all the indications of, of, of a really specific kind of activity going on. People in the early Holocene were probably coming into the upper system of Bajan with a task in mind. They brought the materials with them to, to complete that task, um, probably coming from a, a long, traveling a pretty long distance from a, a base camp somewhere else, which represents a long distance logistical extraction kind of land use system. During the middle Holocene, again, we see this shift to uh, more local lithic raw material use a lot of diversity in the toolkits. These are these notch points that, that Dale mentioned before. Um, there's, there are these pretty uh, heavy, robust points, probably used as part of an atolatal system for hunting caribou, um, but we see a lot of heavy scrapers, a variety of different tool types, um, just a lot of diversity suggesting that a variety of, of tasks are occurring at, at this site in the middle Holocene. Again, this is all from one site, so we're looking at how the technology changes over time. Um, there's tool maintenance going on, but there's also a lot of initial tool production, again, using this local raw material. So this has more of a signature of this residential camp, um, you know, possibly a residential base from, from where people are, are foraying out within this upland area to other kind of task specific camps. And this suggests that by the middle Holocene, there's a more permanent uh, uh, land use system focused in the uplands. And I'm not going to get into the late Holocene stuff here, because uh, this is the, the, the most interesting change that we see is from that early Holocene to the, to the middle Holocene. So this is from another publication I, I put out in Geoarchaeology, just kind of piecing all this information together in the upper Susitna Basin. This is just focused on the, the upper Susitna Basin and shows what we know about the, the archaeology from, based on the work we've done there so far. So when did humans occupy this part of the Alaska Range? Um, well, we, we see evidence about 11,000 years ago is the first good evidence we have. What was the environmental context? Well, the landscape had recovered. I've done some paleo environmental research up here, but we haven't gotten cores that are old enough to capture this time period. The work I've done mostly just captures the, the middle and late Holocene and suggests that the, the vegetation was pretty similar to what it is today. Um, what was the nature of occupation over time? Well, we've got these ephemeral kind of initial occupations. And once this middle Holocene early to, to middle Holocene period hits, we start getting much more frequent occupations. There are more um, intensive occupations. Um, and then this, so this Watana tephra is the most significant tephra fall we see. And after that, occupation drops off a little bit. Um, and so it looks like there's pretty robust occupation in the middle Holocene, but after the Watana uh, tephra fall uh, occurs, um, people kind of abandon this area for a little bit. Now, granted, we need more we need more dated sites. We need more information to to securely say this. But these initial indications are that people uh, abandon this area, and so this is important because we're talking about you know kind of uh, were people using the uplands? Yes or no? Well, what we're learning is that there's kind of these shorter scale um, environmental uh, uh, incidents that are influencing whether people use the the uplands. And so, you know, models like potters are really interesting for kind of setting these big picture things. But once you get down on the ground and start testing these models, you find that there are these kind of particular things going on in some areas that are influencing change on shorter time periods, uh, on, sh on shorter time scales. Um, and so in general, this counters, this research counters this prevailing model um, that folks in the, uh, the late Pleistocene and early Holocene were sticking mostly to the to the lowlands and just kind of moving the residences around the lowlands. We do see evidence for logistical um, land use pretty early on in, in the central Alaska range. And again, the, the raw materials suggest that people are familiar with resources in these upland areas in, in some cases. Um, but for sure, we do see a change in, in intensification in, in the middle Holocene period. Um, so, you know, this is still a work in progress. Um, I'm still exploring this, these areas up in the upper Susitna Basin, and I'm going to expand to other areas in the Alaska Range. Uh, but this is kind of the state of our knowledge as we know of it now. And so now I'm going to, you know, do a 
a little bit of a 180 on you and I'm gonna shift gears to my, my research in the Paisley Caves. Again, still grounded in those big big picture ideas about um, the initial peopling of the Americas and use of marginal landscapes. And so I know you're familiar with the, the Paisley Caves, so I'll just kind of go through some of these side slides, giving some background, but won't dwell on it too much because I know Dennis has probably done a better job than I can talking about this site since it's his site. Um, so the Paisley Caves are located up here in South Central Oregon. Um, here's a picture of me doing uh, some vegetation survey, just collecting excuse me, plant samples in this area back uh, a few years back. Um, there's a series of caves along this, and these were all kind of cut into the side of this, this Paisley Five Mile Butte uh, in the Pleistocene period. Um, there's evidence, as Dennis told you, of people going back 14,500 years ago or so, and all the way through the historic period. There's a series of caves here, but I'm just going to talk about the work we've been doing in Cave 5 down here in the bottom and, and Cave 2 down here in the lower right. And these are where some of these oldest deposits have been, have been recovered at Paisley Caves. Um, you know, as you know from Dennis's work, there's a really interesting uh, organic record, and that's related to the environment of these caves, right? It's really hyper arid. There's really good organic preservation. Um, there's uh, these deep sediment sequences, like you see here in Cave Two, uh, representing the most of the end of the Pleistocene and early part of the Holocene. And um, as I was saying, you know, in the uplands, we sometimes struggle to get wet, uh, deeply buried materials. But if you can get deeply buried materials, you're usually going to get really good chron chronology because you get uh, occupations happening and then they're buried by sediments kind of sealing them off over time. <clears throat> so of interest to, to my research is this western stemmed occupation that is really well preserved down here at the bottom of this sediment profile. This is a close-up in the lower left of uh, what Dennis has called the, the botanical lens. Um, and this is associated with this western stemmed occupation dating between about 12,900 and 10,800 years ago. And there's just all kinds of, of, of goodies in this, this botanical lens. There's uh, wads of pronghorn hair from people preparing hides. There's sagebrush matting. Um, there's um, all kinds of interesting organic preservation, um, including things like uh, insect um, uh, remains, the earliest evidence for, for bed bugs associated for, with human occupation in the Americas. Um, this is some of the cut pronghorn hair, again, representing people preparing highs and cutting off wads of pronghorn hair with, with stone tools. Um, we get things like cordage dating back 12,000 years ago. And of course, with great uh, uh, organic preservation, we get coprolites, right? And the, the famous Paisley Caves coprolites um, that have been reported around the world. These coprolites have been somewhat controversial, right? There is, they did uh, human, uh, or they analyzed DNA and recovered human uh, uh, DNA from these um, in a publication that came out in 2008. And this was a big splash at the time and provided evidence for, um, you know, pre pretty solid evidence that was considered at the time for pre Clovis occupation of the Americas. But, you know, as, as happens with these papers, there was a couple of rebuttal papers that came out that kind of started picking apart the arguments. And there was essentially this kind of debate that was ongoing in the archaeological community about, you know, which side you were on with the Paisley Cave stuff. And that's where our project kind of comes in. One of the things we're interested in is applying new techniques for understanding um, uh, uh, this early occupation there. So two project goals, you know, looking at the timing of the initial occupation of Paisley Caves, but again, moving past just when people got there, really interested in how people were living their lives at, uh, during that initial period and in the uh, late glacial period as well. So um, I work with some really talented geochemists based over in the UK that do biomolecular analysis. And I'll give uh, my next slide, I'll give a little bit more detail on, on, on how they approach that. Um, but we're doing sedimentary analysis. This is us collecting uh, blocks of sediment that we are creating, uh, that, we, that we use to create these microscopic thin sections. So we can look at the sediments under a microscope and see how the site was formed. And we're also in, engaged in a long-term uh, study of, of a, a large sample of coprolites from this site to reconstruct um, diets over time. And so I don't know how much Dennis shared with you of this. This paper, I think, was probably out by when Dennis came to give his talk. Um, but I'll just give you some overview of this. Uh, again, these organic, organic chemists that I work with um, are looking for these um, biomarkers in the feces. And these are just these complex organic compounds. 
they're much more stable than DNA and less, less mobile in sediments. So one of the criticisms of the Paisley coprolites is that it, the, the DNA that got there probably came from above and was washed down into the coprolites from a later period occupation, right? But we don't expect that these uh, biomarkers that we're using, these fecal biomarkers would be mobile like that in the sediments. There's two particular types of fecal biomarkers we're interested in, these five beta stanols and bile acid biomarkers. And when we see these types of biomarkers in the coprolates, we know that they're human. Humans produce these, this unique combination of fecal biomarkers. So when we see these, we know they're human. Um, they're produced, you know, you're all familiar with cholesterol. Your doctor probably tells you you don't have too much of it. Well, cholesterol is uh, transformed into copper stanol in the gut. Right, and copper stanol is one of these biomarkers that we can detect um, in the, in the feces that indicate that it's um, uh, it's one of it's one of these major five beta stanols in human feces. So when we see large amounts of copper stanol and and these bile acid signatures, we know that these are human. Uh, feces. How do we analyze these? Well, we take little samples of these coprolites and we analyze them by gas chromatography, uh, mass spectrometry. And, you know, this is a whole other area of expertise that, that I, I am just continuing to learn about by working with these organic chemists. But just to say that, you know, you get a readout that looks something like this, and it tells you, um, you know, the intensity or how much, is, uh, what proportions of some of these fecal biomarkers are present in your sample. And you can see here that this is a, this is a sample that has been identified as human because it has this spike of copper stanol. And so we, we analyze all this, the samples like this and look for these specific spikes that indicate that these are humans. And as a result of this, we were able to, to conclusively say that people were at this site in the pre-Clovis period. This is the paper that um, I should update. This, is, this was actually published uh, in, in the journal Science Advances. Um, so we do find evidence for pre-Clovis uh, for pre-Clovis occupation here, but we do actually kind of support some of the the evidence for contamination. So some of these early uh, coprolites that we find here had human DNA, but based on our analysis, they're not human. They're probably uh, they're carnivore, probably canid, as is as is shown here. So there is maybe some evidence supporting this DNA contamination, but by our measure, we we think we have a much more secure handle on. Um, on the you know the the human coprolites, which coprolites are human, and we do still find evidence for for humans at the site fourteen thousand two hundred years ago. And so again, moving past just that timing, I'm really interested in this Western stem period, um, you know, which probably links back to that earliest occupation. Although there are no secure Western stem uh, stemmed points that that come from that early occupation, it's just presumed that that's probably Western stem people. Um, but you know, this is a, a period of, of radical landscape change in this area. Um, during the, the last glacial maximum, there was a lot of lakes, uh, pluvial lakes that filled the valley bottoms in this area. But by about 14,000 years ago, again, when people were coming to Paisley Caves for the first time, these lake levels were dropping and this landscape was, was transforming. We see all these productive wetland systems emerging in these valley bottoms. Um, and then things changed again in the Holocene by about 11,000 years ago. It started becoming increasingly arid. The lakes and wetlands were dry by about 8,000 years ago. And it probably looked more like what we see when we drive through this area today, this kind of high desert area. And this Western stem tradition period kind of uh, overlaps that transition right there from um, wet wetland areas to that era, the beginning of that arid period, arid period. And so my, I'm interested in how people adapted to this changing arid landscape. Um, you know, how did they adapt to this, uh, this um, increasingly arid landscape? Okay. Just turn the volume up on that, I can't reach it. And then, um, uh, so this is kind of what we know about this Western stem tradition right now. Um, we've got kind of these competing ideas of how, of how uh, Western stem people um, uh, made a living during this time, right? We see sites that are commonly uh, located in caves near wetlands. Um, we see evidence for large and small mammal subsistence. Um, we see evidence for uh, 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 Sorry about that. Uh, evidence for a textile industry um, that seems to be focused on raw materials from wetland areas. Um, people seem to be settling down and, and taking the time to produce these textiles. You know, so um, this all suggests that there's this really broad-based subsistence strategy, and people were probably settling that, settling down in these longer-term camps near valley bottoms. 
Um, so this is based on the you know subsistence data and textile data. But then we get to looking at the the stone tools, and we see that these tools are found all over the landscape again. You know, up into these high elevation areas, there are these large projectile points with impact factors suggesting that people were using them to hunt large mammals. Again, we look at the lithic raw material sources, and these raw materials are coming from hundreds of kilometers away. Um, and some people interpret this to represent more of a narrow subsistence strategy of people that are, you know, they, they're not staying down by the, these, these uh, wetland areas, they're actually moving around a lot more um, and, and living in short term camps for parts of the year. And so there's kind of these contrasting lines of evidence. And I'm interested in, in trying to figure this out. What was the nature of this, the Western stem diets? Was it narrow? Uh, subsistence focused on large mammals, or was it this broad-based subsistence incorporating a lot of different types of resources? And I'm also interested in whether we can identify season of occupation at the Paisley Caves to kind of speak to whether people were there year-round, or whether they were there, uh, um, you know, just on a seasonal basis. And that's where this coprolite research comes in. And coprolites are really wonderful uh, little nuggets of information, right? You can get all kinds of information about what people were doing in the past from, from their feces. Um, and so my particular contribution to this project is looking at these remains from the feces, looking at the macrofossils, things like plants. Um, I have colleagues that identify the animal bones and insect parts. And I look at the microfossils, like the pollen, phytoliths, which are these little silica um, uh, casts that are formed in plants that preserve really well and, and, the, and uh, uh, they, they will survive through digestion and can kind of tell you what kind of plants people were eating. Um, and I take this information that we get from these coprolites to estimate um, what the diets were comprised of and um, look at the plant and animal life cycles to estimate seasons of season of occupation. And so this is just uh, some data that we were working with from these Western stem tradition coprolites. Again, this is something that was published in Archaeological and Anthropological Sciences. Um, uh, we've got nine coprolites from this younger Dryas and early Holocene occupation. Um, this is the, the age range of these coprolites kind of spanning that end of the Pleistocene, early part of the Holocene period. And so what do these coprolites tell us about what people were eating? Well, I'll just kind of go one by one through some of these samples. Um, this is one of these samples, we'll call it coprolite 98, dates to about 12,000, uh, five to 12,000 years ago. Um, has evidence for consumption of amaranth seed. Uh, there's bird, bo uh, bird uh, feathers that were recovered from this coprolite, pollen from cattail, uh, pollen from sagebrush, uh, some unidentified bones from small to medium mammals. And the, the fact that we're getting amaranth seed suggests that people were here in the late summer or, or early fall during the, during the time when this coprolite was deposited. Looking at another coprolite here, coprolite number 56. This one dates to, again, the very last uh, gasp of the Pleistocene and into the early part of the, uh, 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 early part of the Holocene. Um, a variety of different plant foods represented, grass seeds, rose seeds, um, possible fruit skins. We also find rodent bones. And this is something, this is the pattern that we see um, throughout the, the occupation of the Paisley Cave. But with this study, we've identified the earliest direct evidence for rodent consumption. And it appears that people were eating rodents uh, whole, right? So they weren't processing that much. And we know that because we're finding phalanges and corpus ungris, so basically the, the toes and toenails of rodents. Um, so people are probably consuming Consuming these whole. Here are some of these phytoliths that I mentioned. These are phytoliths from grass husks. Grass husks. Um, the, the pollen from this mostly represents just an environmental signal. Um, we do see, uh, we have uh, evidence for consumption of beetle as well. And so based on the rose tips, we think this is probably represents a late summer or fall or, or early part of winter occupation. Uh, and, you know, this person had a meal of rose hips, rodent, grass seeds, and beetles that they consumed uh, while at the caves. Um, coprolite number 92, this is the early part of the Holocene. Um, this has, again, in evidence for consumption of rodent, um, a variety of different insects represented here. Uh, the first direct evidence for consumption of desert stink beetle. Um, we have evidence for consumption of 10 line June beetle, um, also Jerusalem cr cricket. Uh, again, grass seed, uh, pollen from evening primrose, suggesting that some part of the evening primrose plant was being consumed. Um, and so with this meal, we have uh, grass seeds on the menu, um, primrose, rodent, and various types of insects. And this suggests uh, a summer fall occupation um, from the individual that left this coprolite. 
So just kind of giving you an overview of some of these, the, the more interesting samples. This summarizes the work that we've done with understanding Western stem tradition diets during this time. Um, and it's important to know that there is bias in each of these data sets, right? The, the excreted evidence from the coprolites is gonna be biased because you don't expect to find really big bones there. You're not gonna find, presumably not gonna find pronghorn bones, right? But we do find that in the archeological data. So it's good to combine both of these things, which is what I do in this figure here. So, um, you know, we have evidence for consumption of pronghorn and mountain sheep, cottontail. We do have some evidence for plant use um, through from the archeological data. Uh, but, you know, some of this stuff, we're not sure, there's questions about whether it's cultural, right? You find insect parts, are people really eating crickets or are they just crickets that were in the cave? And so the, the evidence from coprolates really secures that, right? So we know that people were eating these things because they're in their feces, right? Particularly if they're in high quantities in their feces. And so you can see all the information that we've added to, the, to our knowledge of Western stem tradition diets, um, just based on this limited study of nine coprolates from this site. And so we've really kind of secured this, this understanding that the occupants of Paisley Caves during the Western stem tradition had a broad base of system strategy. Now, sure, they were hunting some large mammals like, like pronghorn, but they were also consuming a wide variety of different types of resources. Um, and so these challenge these models of early subsistence and, and really highlight the importance of plant foods during this initial peopling of the America, right? Um, we're, we're, often so off, we're, we're so often focused when we talk about peopling of the Americas on, on what kind of large mammals people were eating. But we've got this growing body of evidence that plant foods are, were just as important, right? Um, and now we're actually finding the solid evidence to, to support that through studies like this. So just to sum up our work there, um, we've, We've really highlighted the dietary diversity during this time period. Um, this shows there's just these uh, uh, not these nine samples that we've that we've uh, analyzed. Um, evidence for occupations primarily in the fall and summer, some spring and winter, but primarily it looks like. Um, people were at the Paisley Caves in the summer and fall, which kind of speaks to this broader land use pattern, probably not settling down year round here, like some models suggest. They're probably, um, this is just one part of, of a seasonal land, land use uh, pattern. Um, and again, just, to, just to, to, to speak to the variety of food items that we're, we're having evidence for, for people eating. And to, so to, to try to, um, you know, project what we're gonna go with this in the future. We're still working with some coprolites. We're looking at how diets change over time. Um, I'll say that the middle Holocene samples I'm working with show that there's a lot more seed diversity, which speaks to that, that those questions I was interested in of uh, intensification of land use over time. We see some evidence, some preliminary results from the middle Holocene uh, coprolites suggest that people are more intensively using plant resources. Um, we're starting to see some other evidence of non-food plant consumption. I found a wild tobacco seed from a late Holocene coprolite dating to about 2000 years ago, right? So evidence, interesting evidence for, for things other than just subsistence, right? We're, we're getting at um, psychoactive plant use uh, at, at this site here. Um, we're also look, doing the various types of other types of various types of other analyses, looking at isotope analysis, um, analyzing parasites from the coprolites to get at uh, other questions of diet and health. So lots of work to do still with, with this site, and I'm excited to continue working with Dennis on this project. So in summary, I'm going to return to those research questions that I said guide me, right? Um, you know, within this big picture of looking at how humans and humans interact with the environment um, in prehistoric North America, uh, the evidence that I presented here today shows that these um, uh, earliest evidence, the earliest archaeological visible populations in the Great Basin and Alaska had really diverse land use strategies. And, you know, occupied a variety of different topographic and ecological landscapes, including marginal environments, right? So these marginal environments were, particularly in Alaska, these high altitude environments were, were important pretty early on in the process of settling North America, right? Which speaks to some of the ideas in the Shehala hypothesis of, you know, um, people being comfortable in these landscapes and being able to navigate through them and move through them the, uh, as part of just their, their seasonal rounds, right? So it doesn't even have to be, um, uh, you know, let's get up and march through the mountains. People are exploring and foraying through these areas as part of just their 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 day-to-day, year-to-year lives. And so, you know, gradually expanding out probably into new areas. 
I mean, again, this kind of counters this idea that, that people were relegated to specific areas in, in these early occupations of, the, of, the, of uh, Alaska and the Great Basin. And we also see from the evidence I presented in Alaska and, and the preliminary evidence in, in the, the Great Basin that um, these marginal environments appear to have been used more, more intensively during the middle and late Holocene, um, both in the Great Basin and, and Alaska, right? And this supports this global trend of increasing Holocene land use int intensification over time. Um, and so uh, one of the bigger picture questions I'm still, you know, seeking to address with my research kind of long term is really getting nailing down what the factors are that are driving these changes over time. You know, this is just ongoing research that I'm engaged in. Um, and the bigger picture context for this, uh, you know, really getting to, to, to understand these, these, these things, how these changes happened, um, are really going to help us understand the impacts of modern climate change. How is climate change going to impact our modern food systems, um, particularly in small scale subsistence based societies? There are still native Alaskan groups in, in Alaska that depend on subsistence activities, right? They're, they're still getting a lot of their, their calories from, from season to season from hunting and, and gathering um, up there. So there are still people that, that whose uh, food systems are going to be impacted more significantly um, than, for, say, your average American. Um, who will just see higher prices at the grocery store, right? So I'm interested in how this can be applied to, to kind of the modern situations as well. Um, and, you know, I, I would just close by saying that we really need to explore uh, late glacial human behavior on a variety of different landscapes and really expand our search for, for where these early people were, 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 were living and, and, and foraying into to, to, to get to a better understanding of how this process of settlement occurred over time, right? And that's why I think that this, is, this research really ties into, on a big picture, the Chehalis uh, River hypothesis, right? Um, you know, areas that people haven't really paid enough attention to, but we need to start focusing on to, to, to get a better picture for how this process happened, right? Because we get too locked into areas where we know we have some good data and we keep digging there and we think, seem to think that that's the, 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 the center of the universe of, of, of the peopling of the Americas, right? But just getting out and exploring some more areas is gonna really help us understand a little bit better um, uh, how, how people moved into this country. And so I'll just close by saying that, that this is part of my, kind of my goals of my long-term research again, agenda is really to study these questions and, and get a better understanding of the, this process of the peopling of the Americas. So um, just one last slide here, just to acknowledge my collaborators um, from around the world, most of the UK and the US and just the, the, the funders that have supported this research. And I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions if anybody has them. John? Yes. I wonder if population density may have forced the occupation of these less ideal areas. Yeah, that's that's one of the hypotheses, yeah, that over time people are moving into these more marginal environments, right? Because there's there's a competition for resources. I will say though, you know, when we're when we're seeing this these early occupations in the in the interior part of Alaska, we don't seem to have the the site density um, that that would suggest that demographics are really driving that initial uh, that initial drive to get into the uplands. Um, I would say that probably when we see, start seeing that real intensive occupation in the middle Holocene, um, you know still work in progress trying to understand that, but I would say that, that's, that there's probably a link there with demography. By that point, people are, you know, the populations are growing in, in, in interior part of Alaska, people are settling in the landscape and probably territoriality coming into play there. And um, so, yes, I would agree that, that that's driving some of that in, in the middle Holocene, at least. Another question I have for you is the frequency or occurrence of salmonids and salmon in your Alaska. Uh, highland areas in your study area. Yeah, and so the, the, the salmon don't actually run that far up there. They, they kind of cut out um, uh, the middle part of the Susitna River, so they don't actually get all the way up into that area. Um, and it's kind of interesting. So the, the, you know, the descendants of, of the, the prehistoric people that I study are, are the Atna, right? And so the, the Atna are kind of separated into different clans and, and the, the Western Atna are the ones that, are, that consider my study area their traditional territory. And they're kind of known as the caribou hunters, right? And they're, they're, they're cousins, the, 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 the other uh, uh, groups of Atna are more of the salmon. They're, they're more focused on the Copper River area. And they're more kind of known for their, their, their focus on salmon subsistence. And so 
it seems like in that area that I'm doing the, the field work in up in Alaska, it's more of a, of a, of a long-term um, focus on caribou up there. That seems to be what people were doing up there is, is, is going to hunt caribou. Um, but they, there's been some really interesting research pushing back the timing of salmon use on, uh, in the, mostly in these lowland areas. Um, they look, they've got some interesting isotopic evidence for, for salmons going pretty far back. Um, but, but just to say that, that in my specific area, we don't have that evidence yet. It seems like caribou hunting is one of the main drivers in that region. Okay. Thank you. Sure. And um, you can put your yep. hand too, yep. Okay. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Hi, uh, hi. Hi, everyone. Uh, hi. Wonderful talk. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Thank you. You still, have, you still have two feet of snow in Sitka? No, it's already melting off. Of course, oh. that our time <laughs> climate, you know. <laughs> yeah, so we'll probably get more tomorrow and then it'll be gone by Saturday. <laughs> yeah, so we'll enjoy it while we can. Um, well, you know, your, your thoughts on, you know, expanding our ideas of, um, you know, the peopling of the Americas. I, I love that. I'm definitely a Trans-Pacific migration <laughs> gal over here in Sitka in Southeast Alaska. And yeah. I wondered if you had any uh, thoughts of, um, uh, or interest in uh, some of Ackerman's work uh, in Glacier Bay and, you know, like the Groundhog Bay site that's, uh, it's a shell midden, but, um, you know, some of the older sites around Southeast Alaska, a lot of work, uh, refugia um, studies that Bachel's doing on Prince of Wales Island and, you know, some of that good work, you know, um, we, I, I feel like if we did a little more, if there was a little more interest in Southeast Alaska, we'd find a little bit more in some older sites. So, um, yeah, I'm always interested in people coming to Southeast yeah, there, there's a lot of interesting stuff there. You know, there's a there's a PhD student that, that's up at University of Alaska Fairbanks named uh, Nicholas Schmuck, and he's he's working down there right now too. He's really interested in in that that early archaeology down there, and I mean, I'd love to get down there. I just haven't had the opportunity to. I, I'd love to explore some of those those you know those those refugia area. So for my mind, it'd be interesting to do some environmental work down there and try to you know uh, pin down where we might have some of these refugia, and then start going and looking for archaeological sites down there. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, most of my work has been just focused on the, the central part of Alaska and the uplands areas. Um, mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I've got a lot, I've got a long list of things I want to do in Alaska over the rest of my career. And so that's yeah. getting down there. It's definitely one of them. <laughs> so, yep. Yep. Well, if we could just go to some of Ackerman sites and uh, relocate some of that and expand on that, that would be really cool. Yeah, I think so. And that's one thing that, um, you know, as Dale mentioned, I've um, you know, I've reached out to Bob and we've had a couple of communications and, um, you know, I think he's been going through a lot recently with, with the, in the past couple of years or so, but, uh, but uh, we've got some plans to, to kind of connect and, and um, you know, I just took on a PhD student who's interested in Alaska research and I want him to be involved in working with some of Bob's stuff too. And so, so yeah, there's some, some long-term plans there to, if Bob's willing to, to share his knowledge with me, I'd love to, to get up there and do some of that work. Awesome. Uh, I do have one more question um, yeah, sure. the, the paisley caves and the copper lights do you think that if this is way out there if they're um eating uh rodents whole that they might be hungry or eating you know crickets that um it would indicate that they were hungry or starving or just it's just or you know and the diversity i guess i mean they're like yeah. eating everything. yeah yeah, so you know, usually when we see that stuff, if we're, if you know, there's a kind of a, a a theoretical approach to understanding diets that says that you know it's like human behavioral ecology that says that you know the only time you should see things like that that are kind of what they would have like they would characterize as having a basically a low energy return for the for the amount of time you're you're taking to get the food right. The only time we should see that kind of stuff, according to this, this perspective, is when the, the big stuff is, is hard to find or is no longer the landscape, right? If it's if it's if if you're if you want to go out and hunt an antelope and it's going to take you six days to find one, then you're going to have to eat something in the meantime, right, until you find that. Yeah. So there there is an argument to be made that that perhaps we're looking at some some shortages seasonally. Um, but I'll also say that you know if you read the ethnographies, there there's uh, there's evidence that people were eating uh, rodents, and you know it's not necessarily based on the ethnographies linked to 
to to to starvation foods or or, or shortages. It's just um, you know it's just considered more of a common part of the the uh, the the food. One one interesting thing is that um, there in some of, you read some of the ethnographies and some of it is just kind of children hunting. You know they're they're like sit, hanging around in the caves and smoking out. They're just you know setting little traps or smoking out rodents or something and. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't want to project too much on, 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 you know, my ideas of food or whatever, but I can imagine a, a you know, a mouse getting thrown in the soup or something. If it's, if, 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 if a kid comes, comes back with a mouse, you just throw it in the soup or something like that in the, in the boiling pot. Um, so, you know, we still have a lot to learn about the role that these foods played. I would say that insects are an interesting one because insects are actually very nutritious, right? They've got a pretty good uh, protein return and they've actually got some interesting micronutrients. And you know, if we think about like how we're we're trying to move towards more sustainable food sources in, in the modern world, one of the pushes is for insects, right? And there are these insect farms where they're farming insects, and you know, some stores you can actually buy insects or at least insect uh, flour, so they're grinding them down and producing a high protein flour. And so, you know, this that might be a case where you know uh, native folks are onto something that we're just finally coming back around to again is that this is actually a good food source. Um, and food preparation might be different than we we uh, would do it today, right? Um, but you know that's just kind of a cultural thing, right? The at the heart of it, you're, they're still eating a, a high energy, high protein food resource. And insects are consumed by by people around the world. It's just you know folks that have more of a Western European tradition don't tend to have that as part of their normal diet. Um, but I think I'd say that's one example of a, of a nutritious food source that I would say that that was probably a regular contributor to the diet. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Ann. Uh, yeah. I, I want to get to Douglas. Uh, Robert McClure asked a question about the first slide showing occupation in South America, modern day Chile, circa yeah. 1,500. Did I? Did he get it wrong? He was wondering. Uh, no, and so I can go back to that. And that that's Monte Verde there. So that's. Um, yeah, Monte yeah, Monte Verde, yeah. And so, and that's one of the things we're trying to square is how, how some of that early evidence down there, how, how did people get down there 14,500 years ago? Um, and you know, certainly if, if we're looking at 14,000 or 14,200 occupation of Paisley Caves, well, that's, that's after that, right? And so um, I would say that I'm interested in this story of the peopling of the Americas, but I haven't found the earliest site yet, right? I mean, I'm looking for that early evidence and I'm interested in this early time frame. but um, a lot of the work that I've been doing is stuff that's kind of around that 14,000 year old period. And that's one of the questions we're still trying to figure out is, okay, we've got these interesting sites in North America that date to 14,000 years ago, but how does that square with, with Monte Verde down there in South America earlier than that, right? And that suggests that, well, you know, we've got um, sites like Cooper's Ferry that, that you know, that, that may date to about 16,000 years ago. We're starting to date things back to 15, 16,000 years ago. And more and more archaeologists are kind of on board with that 15 to 16,000, those 15 to 16,000 year old uh, sites. And so, you know, maybe that gives people enough time to, to move down there, you know, presuming that they're moving along the coast and still kind of, you know, hopping along and able to cover some ground. But that's part of that interesting story we don't know yet. You know, we don't know how all this ties together. We've got these interesting data points, like I said at the outset, and we're still trying to figure this all out, which is why I think it's an exciting time period to be studying. Yep. Douglas, you have a question? Uh, yes, John, this is Doug Ryan in Olympia. Um, Hi, I, I had a question about the seasonal occupation of the cave, Paisley Caves. Yeah. Um, in East Africa, even in modern times, nomadic people like the Maasai move their camps about every three months. And one of the reasons is because of the buildup of manure from their cattle and sheep, mm -hmm. that the sites become, there's too much disease and flies. And, and, and they don't come back to a, a site for several years. Natural processes <laughs> have done away with the manure. Uh, would it be possible that those Paisley caves might have become uh, unfit for occupation from the coprolite after several months, and yeah, I just let it you know go away, you know, and only come back and reoccupy it after natural processes have cleaned it up. Yeah, and there's some really interesting stuff with that during that Western stem tradition, that botanical lens. And there's some ideas I believe that Dennis has published on about, you know, maybe it's kind of a messy cave with a bunch of stuff laying around. And so people are taking sagebrush and they're breaking up the sagebrush bark and, and making like a bedding, almost kind of refreshing the floor or something. I think that's the way Dennis characterizes that as kind of yeah. pl placing down some flooring. And so, um, yeah, we would presume that there is 
you know, that there is going to be, well, th there's preserved organic material even today. So we know that those copper lakes are going to be preserved there probably the next season. One thing that's interesting about the Paisley Caves is that there are several caves there. And we just don't have the, the, the ability with the radiocarbon dating to get at, you know, year by year occupations. It may be that people are in one cave one year and they don't go back to that cave for another several years, but they're at the, the next cave over or something. And, and we also don't know if they're living in one cave and, you know, it's only a few minute walk to the next cave. Maybe the next cave is where they were going to the bathroom one year and then they switched the, the, the following mm -hmm. year. Mm -hmm. so, so yeah, absolutely. There are some, some things that, that to consider with, with um, you know, um, that may explain the, the, you know, the seasonal use patterns that we're seeing there. So if, even then sanitation may have been a factor in their lifestyle. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, you would presume so, right? I mean, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's presumably there, there's, there's some conscious decision-making going on there about, about uh, you know, avoidance of, of feces close to food and that type of stuff. Sure. Thank you, John. Yeah, thank you. D David Munsell here again. One of the things I noted in Ecuador in small mountain villages is the lack of outhouses, but the presence of dogs and pigs that ran freely. And dogs were typically used to clean babies' bottoms and uh, to eat the feces off of the ground. So I wonder if in Paisley Caves, whether or not the people had dogs or not. Well, that's a really interesting question. And that's something that we're working on. I'll tell you from my analysis, we're getting some really interesting signals. So we're doing this analysis, the, the uh, biomolecular analysis, and we can tell whether it's a human poop or a, a carnivore is, is kind of the, 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 the category, but we assume canid. Um, and we're seeing canid feces with human dietary remains. And it's the same stuff that are, that, that are in the human poops from that same time period, right? And that to us suggests that those are domesticated dogs, right? And that those domesticated dogs are probably eating, the, uh, we, we do have some coprolites that have mixed signals for both canid and human, suggesting that they're eating human feces. So that's something that we're, that we're really interested in, really working on trying to expand a little bit. We've got these, uh, these indications that that is exactly what's happening here, that people probably are keeping dogs and that they're probably using dogs in some way to clean up around camp, whether it's purposeful or, I don't know, I'm, I take my dog out for a walk and I don't want her to eat the poop, but she still sneaks them in every once in a while, you know, when I'm not looking. So whether it's purposeful or whether it's, um, you know, just happening um, uh, just because these are dogs living amongst them, um, which I guess links back to Douglas's, uh, to Doug's question too, you know, maybe there is some sort of sanitation going on linked to, to keeping dogs. So absolutely, we're seeing that pattern and that's something that we wanna explore a little bit more you know, potentially do some DNA work to, 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 to get a DNA profile for these, these uh, canids and see if they, are, if they do have um, a profile that looks like a domesticated dog from, from that time period. But we've got some other bones that we've been able to extract DNA from. So yeah, that's something that, we, that we've kind of an exciting find from this, this study. Great. More questions? Uh, John, I was just interested in, uh, you know, the seed chart you showed. You showed acorns. Is there signs that acorns are a um, major seed being used? Oh, no. Sorry. That, that was probably a little misleading. I was just looking, you know, you put a, a little... <laughs> a little, yeah, it was just the, the, the most recognizable kind of seed icon, I guess. I, if you just put like a little seed up there, people wouldn't know what it was. Like, so I kind of just use that as a... Yeah, okay. so. So no, we don't we don't have any evidence for acorns. Um, that would be interesting. Obviously, that's more you know you get that more on the, the coastal yep. areas. Um, we we don't have that. Um, you know we've got some pinion showing up in, in later period in, in the coprolites, and actually we've got some some macrofossils in the in the actual archaeological deposits in the early Holocene too. But but uh, but no 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 acorns there. We had a lot of acorn in Mud Bay and Sunken Village. It just caught my interest. The other thing is, do the insects ever have signs of burning on them uh, from the copper lice, like they've been roasted or fried or anything? Yeah, you know, that's something that our, our insect analyst is still working on. And I would say that most of the ones that I've seen, it doesn't, they don't look to, to have that in any, any indication of that. 
like charring because you know when again you read the ethnographic letter and a lot of times they were harvested and just kind of you know tossed with some coals or something or some hot rocks and, and toasted up a little bit tossed in a large basket and um i would say that from from you know i'm the one who picks them out of the the poop and then i just put them in containers and send them to him but i haven't seen any regularly patterning of that i think i've probably seen some here and there that might have some some kind of reddening that looks like burning or something but um, a lot of the stuff we've been saying, it seems to be, uh, they don't seem to be uh, toasted at least or, or, or roasted. I see. Other questions? I'm going to throw in another one. You said fungus and uh, parasites. And maybe this is way up a little bit. You, how about bacteria? Do you, do you find bacteria in the carpalites of some sort that might be a signature? You know, there are some people that are doing some interesting research, and that kind of links in again to, to genetic type stuff. There's, you know, there's people that are extracting genetic profiles from um, like gut bacteria in coprolites now. And so there's some really interesting stuff looking at the gut microbiomes of, of prehistoric hunter gatherers and comparing that to modern populations. Of course, our gut microflora today are, are a lot less diverse and um, kind of a product of our more homogenized Western diet. And so, you know, eating things like diverse range of plants and rodents and insects, I think probably um, uh, led to, or the you know, symbiotic relationship with gut microflora that it enables people to extract a lot of uh, uh, resources out of a lot of energy out of these resources um, that that uh, uh, you know again also these eating these diverse ranges of resources supports the more gut the more diverse gut microflora mm. so yeah so th those type of bacteria absolutely they're profiling those with DNA right now oh I see and be interesting to see how uh, abundant they are how if they were very healthy in terms of their their bacteria array. Yeah, well, the, the the early evidence that we've had from a couple of these studies that come, that have come out are that they do have much healthier gut uh, micro uh, microbe profiles than, than most of most folks living today when they compare them to to, oh. to living living people today. And it's again, I think that's just the product of this kind of diverse diet, very high in a, in a variety of different types of fibers. Um, that's one thing I find a lot of is just a diverse range of fibers in, in, in the copper lights, uh, plant fibers. And so that's one of the keys for supporting um, diverse uh, uh, gut microflora is, is, is diversity of fiber, right? You've, I don't know, doctors always tell you, you need to eat fiber, and eat diverse ranges of fiber, right? Well, these people were doing that for, you know, um, not because their doctor told them to, because that's just because of the type of resources they were eating. And so their, their, their guts were, were uh, better equipped to, to eat that kind of, uh, of fiber. Other, other questions? Doug, did you raise your hand again or is that still up from before? Uh, I, think, I think it's from before. And, okay. I, and I, I guess I have another <laughs> on insects. If, if, the animals were going to the highland to get away from the, the biting flies, I think you said, or, yeah, yeah. you know, would people do, be doing the same thing to get away from mosquitoes? I've, I, you know, even at Mud Bay where we worked, it was a bad mosquito problem. And then it was up the Skeena where we, <laughs> we would go up uh, from uh, Prince Rupert to camp. Uh, we had some real mosquito problems. I don't, is anything going on where people might hit those higher areas at that time, not only to get the resources, but would it be? Yeah, it might've gone hand in hand. You know, there's a lot of times I've worked in the lowlands and the uplands in Alaska, and there's a lot of times I'm grateful to be up in the uplands uh, in the heat of the summer because the, you know, the, the mosquitoes are just form a cloud around you down in the, in the lower areas. Um, and so, you know, it, it might've gone hand in hand with them uh, following the caribou up there. So there may have been benefits for humans too with the, with the insects. Um, you know, I would say that it does seem like that, that people were one of the primary motivators, at least in the Susitna, were, were going after the caribou there. And so, um, you know, or I would say mosquitoes might be a side, an, an added benefit to that. Uh, probably not the primary driver, but, but um, probably an added benefit to that. Okay. Uh, other questions? We have time for one or so more, but... Uh... I, I'd just like to say, I, I talked to Dr. Blong over about a year ago and he wasn't quite ready because he was just getting a WSU and he wasn't, but I'm really happy that he, he kept it in mind and he agreed to do it with us. Uh, 
Ex excellent presentation. Um, Thank you. I appreciate you having me. Yeah, and I I like your idea. I, I I've worked with Robert Ackerman like Ann has, and uh, he really keeps his stuff organized. So I'm sure if you got together with him in his lab, he would he would uh, thrive. Him and he would lo really enjoy that. So tell him hi if you give him a call. I will. Yeah, I, I think uh, you, you've motivated me to, to reach back out to him again because it's been yeah. a while since, since we chatted. Okay, well, we certainly, we certainly thank you. And uh, thank you for uh, letting us record this. Uh, people are very uh, happy with the dog I see from the comments. Thank you. Yeah, no, uh, no problem. It was a pleasure talking to you. And I really like your questions too. It's good to, to, to have a chance to, to talk with you all and, and answer some questions as well. Right. All right. Well, thanks so much. And I really appreciate you working with us on this and, and working with you in the future. Yeah, no problem. I, I hope to see you all again, okay? Yeah, and tell others it's recorded so they, they can see our YouTube channel. I will. I, to, I told my dad. He's, and you he, may want to use it. Yeah, I was, I was going to say, I told my dad it's it's uh, it's too late on the East Coast now for him to be watching this, but I told him uh, he could watch the recording later. So. Who's that? Uh, my, my father is. Oh, yeah. Right. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, Shannon's probably pretty excited about the tobacco you found at about Yeah. Years, you're yeah. Still, Shannon is a yeah. faculty member works with pipes. Yeah, that's a, that's one area that we're looking to collaborate on in the future. Yeah. Okay, well, thanks so much and have a good evening and I think you're about in, you're about done with finals or you're pretty close. Uh, next week is finals week, so yeah, we're getting uh, it. Okay. <laughs> well, good luck with that. Thank have you. A break. Uh, yeah. Happy holidays to everybody. Happy holidays. Nice to see you, Bill. Happy holidays. Thank you. Yeah. See you. Bye. Bill and bye. I are the Santas here. Okay. <laughs> Good night. Good night.